The passage we chanted just now, the world is swept away, does not endure, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge, has nothing of its own, one has to pass on, leaving everything behind. Insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. Those are the reasons a young monk gave one time when a king asked him, why did you ordain? As the king had said, a lot of people ordain because they've lost their health, they've lost uh, their relatives, they've gotten old, but here you are, you're young. Your relatives are still alive, you're still healthy, your family's wealthy. Why did you ordain? And the monk, Ratabala, gave these answers. The first three correspond to the problems of aging, illness, and death. As he said to the king, when the king said, what do you mean the world is swept away? And he said to the king, when you were young, were you strong? He said, yes, sometimes I thought I had the strength of two men. How about now? Well, now I'm 80. Sometimes I mean to put my foot one place and it goes someplace else. Aging. The world offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. He illustrates that with an example of illness. He says, do you have a recurring illness? The king says, yes. Sometimes the courtiers stand around and my relatives stand around and say, maybe this will be his last, maybe this will be his last breath. And Ratabala says, here you are a king. Can you order that the pain that you're feeling can be taken and shared out among others so that you feel less? And the king said, no, I have to face it all alone. That's the principle of illness. And so when the king said, what do you mean the world has nothing of its own? I have storehouses full of gold and silver. And Ratabala says, when you die, can you take it with you? Well, no. So these are basically a reflection on aging, illness, and death. And that last one, if the world is insatiable, a slave to craving, it keeps coming back for more and more and more. The world here basically means the world of your mind. Now, if that was all there was possible for human beings to experience, things that age, grow ill, and die, as they grow, age, grow ill, and die, then you just say, well, learn to accept what you've got and learn to put up with the bad so you can enjoy the good. But the question the Buddha asked, and the question that led him to go off into the wilderness himself, is there another possibility? Is there something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die? And as he termed it later, he said, that's a search for something noble. The search for other things that are subject to aging and illness and death, he says, that's not noble at all. Everybody does that. Even common animals do it. But it takes a human being to figure out maybe there's something deathless, something that doesn't age, grow ill, or die. And so he went forth and he found it. Which is why when they talk about how Buddhism tends to badmouth the world or have a pessimistic view of the world, it's because there's something better. And the quest for it is a noble quest. You develop good qualities of mind, you develop compassion, you develop goodwill, you develop concentration, mindfulness, discernment. You develop the principle of harmlessness. All of these things are noble parts of the path. This is why the path is noble. Not only because it leads to a noble goal, but because the activities that it involves are noble as well. And so you set your sight, as we're meditating, you set your sights high. We've all seen the pleasures that the world has to offer. We figure there must be something better. So part of the contemplation to get our minds on that path is to turn around and look at the drawbacks of the things that we ordinarily go for. The Buddha has an analysis. They're called the, the three perceptions. Sometimes it's called the three characteristics. But it's basically perceptions you develop, and they correspond to those first three 
reflections that Rantabala taught to the king. The world is swept away, and that's the principle of inconstancy. You look at the things that you're trying to hold on to, and you see they just slip through your fingers like water. Offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. That's the principle of stress and pain. If you try to find happiness in things that wobble on you, you there's, no real, there's no real ease. It's like sitting in a chair that wobbles. It's very easy to tip over if you're not really, really careful. And you have nothing of your own. That's the principle of not-self, when you realize that things that are inconstant and stressful are not really worth holding on to as being you or yours. You want something better. And again, these analyses sound pessimistic, but they're pointing that there is something better than all this that we're going for ordinarily. That's why we have the practice, because there is something better. So we keep that in mind. We're aiming for a noble goal, and the means are noble as well. And certain people make the decision to go forth as something that should be encouraged, something that should be admired. As we'll see tomorrow when we have the ordination, it's not just an individual thing. There's a whole community around this now. We've got the candidates going for ordination. There's also the community of monks who take them in and promise to give them a training. Once they see that they're qualified, they say, okay, you can be one of us. And there's no question about race or nationality or language or whatever. I found this when I went to Thailand. The day I ordained, it was like becoming part of a large extended family. Wada Sokaram is a large monastery. There's a large lay community attached to it. It's almost a village. Well, it is a village, basically. And I was taken in, it's just like a member of the village. And all of a sudden they had lots of aunts and uncles. So on the one hand, you've got the community of the monks, but also you've got the, the community of the lay supporters who come and show their encouragement. Because it does require the support of other people. And your people are happy to offer that support. Even though they can't go forth themselves, they see that it's a good thing and they're happy to encourage others. Because the world is a better place because we have people like this. People who are looking for a happiness that's blameless, a happiness that lasts. And living in a community that's happy to share its knowledge. Even though there's no tit for tat arrangement that once you practice and gain the results that you're going to teach other people. Still, if you have the opportunity, you have the talent, you say the people who have gained true awakening are very happy to share their knowledge. They don't sell it, they don't hold it back from anybody. Again, with the John Fuan. Here I was a total stranger. He took me on. After he died, the group of people came one time. There was word had gotten out that his robe, which was part of the museum we had of his effects, had showed a miracle. The sweat had turned into little flakes that looked like looked like diamonds, and the ties of said, "Ah, relics." And we had people driving all the way from Bangkok just to see the robe. One day this one group came. They're from the Department of Education, or Ministry of Education in Thailand. And after they went up to see the robe, they came back down and said, you know, one of the miracles have there been since John Fung passed away? And I said, well, I think it's pretty miraculous that someone drives all the way from Bangkok just to see a piece of cloth. They said, no, 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 that's not what we meant. How about when he was alive? Anything miraculous then? And it would have been possible to talk about John Fung's uncanny powers, but I decided not to. I said, what I found really amazing was that here I was an American, and he was Thai, a very unwesternized Thai. And yet when we talked, there was no barrier about Thai or American at all. It was just one human being talking to another. I said, I thought that was pretty amazing. 
They said, no, no, that's not what we meant. So I gave them some amulets and sent them home. But there was an exchange that when my father came to visit, and John Fung was still alive, and took him to took my father to meditate with the John Fung. And his first question was, you know, here I am a Christian, and is this going to get in the way of the meditation? And as John Fung said, we're, first we're going to talk about the breath. The breath is common property all over the world, and then we're going to, from the breath we talk about the mind, which is also common property all over the world. It doesn't belong to any particular religion. We talk about the mind, we talk about the problem of suffering, which is a universal problem. We talk about suffering because we have a cure. Again, when they say the Buddha's teachings and the Four Noble Truths are pessimistic, the Buddha, the Buddha is not saying life is suffering. He's saying something, something more specific, something a lot more useful. There's suffering and clinging, but the clinging is unnecessary. It's something you can do something about. Another time, someone came to the monastery and they were surprised to see a Westerner. And they asked John Fung, how is it that Westerners can ordain? And his response was, don't Westerners have hearts? So we're talking about a problem that everybody has. And we're talking about a cure that everyone can attempt. And as we'll see, it's not a selfish Cure. Someone, some people say, you're, you're looking out after your own happiness and suffering. What about the rest of the world? Well, if you find a happiness that's blameless, and you do it through virtue, concentration, discernment, or through generosity, virtue, and meditation, how can looking for happiness in that way be a selfish thing? You're looking for happiness that places no burden on anyone, something that doesn't harm anyone. And you look at the world today, and you see that this is a gift. I heard an analogy one time. Someone commented on how even when the monks don't teach, they're a good example. It's like a light, a lamppost by the side of the road. The lamppost just stays there, and it emits light. And in emitting light, it makes everything around a lot brighter. I know some people say that even though they can't come to the monastery, just the fact that they know the monastery exists warms their heart, that there is a place like this where people can practice and conduct the noble search. And there are other people that encourage it. So this is a good family to belong to. We take on the customs of the noble ones to become a part of the noble family. It's a family that stretches way back in time. And as long as we practice, we keep that tradition alive. It's something we do together.